Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Ali Cantor, and I am the director of Project Zug, and I am so thrilled to welcome you all tonight to our kickoff lecture for our first ever PESOP cycle. We have over 400 people who are beginning their four-week learning this evening, um, and we just, we can't wait to get started. Um, before we begin, I just want to introduce my colleague, Aliza Abulafia, who is our Project Zug user coordinator. Um, and many people don't know that we actually match each and every person individually by reading all of your bios and your preferences. And we try to really give you the best possible learning experience throughout your learning. Um, and Eliza has been working extremely hard this past week to match all of you with your Kavruta pairs and will continue to work really hard throughout your whole cycle to make sure everything operates smoothly for the duration of your learning. Um, so I please, please join me in giving a very hearty thank you to Eliza um, and in welcoming, in welcoming her tonight. Eliza, I'm passing to you. Thank you. Thank you, Allie. That was such a warm uh, intro. I really appreciate it. And it is so good. I'm sort of scrolling through all of the faces. It is so good to finally be able to put some faces to all of the names that I've been going through for the past week and a half or so. Just seeing the names come in, see, reading your bios, reading all about your hopes and dreams for this course, for learning more about Pesach, for engaging with other participants. It is really just so amazing and such a, a joy to see all of you together. Um, as Ali said, my name's Aliza. I'm the user coordinator for Project Zug. So again, just to reiterate, if you have any questions, any um, concerns, or if you want to talk about how great Project Zug is and how excited you are and how much you love our programming, um, I, I'm, I am the place. I am the uh, home for all of that. And if you have any ideas about um, other kinds of programming that you want to see or how we can make Project Zug better and a more engaging and wonderful space to be in, um, please let me know. I'll drop my email in the, in the chat after this. And also I know that since it's a pandemic, it's even more special to be able to come together in this way um, and, and learn together and, and use this technology to, to be in more um, intimate learning situations. Um, yeah, so I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm getting my master's at Harvard Divinity School. Getting to be a part of Hadar and Project Zug while I'm in graduate school is really great. Um, and also getting to work with my teachers. I spent two years at Yeshivat Hadar is doubly special. Um, so now I'm going to introduce my teacher, my Rosh Yeshiva, Rav Aviva Richman, who will kick off our learning for the next four weeks. Rav Aviva, start us off. Hello, it's so good to see all of you and so many of your faces. Um, it's really, it's a huge honor and a pleasure to be embarking on this learning with all of you before Pesach. And I wanna thank the whole entire team for making this happen, um, especially Ali and Eliza for the magic touch of um, creating this possibility for all of us to learn together this evening as, as a whole group, but for most of the time, um, you with all of your chavrutas. And I would say this has been a very strange year. Manishtana hashana hazot kol hashanim. It has been a really strange and hard year in so many ways. And it's such a gift to be able to um, also take the opportunities that we have in this time to learn with each other um, and especially to prepare for Passover this year, to learn with people near and far, to learn with people familiar and less familiar. I will just say it, it means so much to me when I get notes from people telling me that they are embarking on this learning with a family member or with a good old friend um, or with their regular chavruta. I've just really appreciated um, hearing from many of you about who you're going to be learning with. And it's it's a treat to start off our learning this evening together. Um, just wanted to start briefly with a, a quick little prompt um, 
I believe that chat is open and this will get this will give us a chance to hear a little bit from each other, even as with a large group of people, it's hard to like have a full discussion as a group. I would love to hear from you. You can put in the chat now. If there is one moment in the Passover story, one moment in the Exodus story, a moment that's either in the Haggadah or not in the Haggadah um, that you particularly like to relive or that you would want to relive? Is there one moment in the Passover story that you would really like to relive year after year? Awesome. The four kids dancing with Miriam, timbrels seeing the sea split. This is great. Keep them coming. Um, I hope we can all we can all join in person and do some of the singing and dancing together. But I invite people to continue to read what is flowing in through the chat. Um, and actually, I also invite you to make sure you're on gallery mode for a second and just scroll through the faces who are here so we feel like we're a little bit in the same room together. Okay, great. We could have like a whole, a whole midrash just on all of the comments coming into the chat. I will also say as you're scrolling through, maybe you identify your chavruta's face in the room, and can send a little chat to say hello, as you're gonna embark on this learning together. Okay, I'm gonna bring us to the main content of our learning this evening. Our course of learning for the next month is a journey. It's really a journey, just like the journey of the Exodus. Um, we're gonna be approaching, maybe re-approaching the central story of the Seder, the Exodus story, through the lens of the Song of Songs, Shir HaShirim, the love poem. And in many ways, there is absolutely nothing creative about this class. We're just following the footsteps of the earliest rabbis who unpacked the Exodus story through juxtaposition with verses from the Song of Songs. And the bulk of your learning in this course in Chavruta is going to be reading through passages of Midrash where the rabbis do exactly that. And in this fusion between the Exodus story um, and the first few chapters of Exodus, and the Song of Songs, the love poem, the Exodus becomes a love story. It's the journey of God and Israel falling in love with each other. Now, the most important aspect of a love story and why I think it's kind of powerful to just have that frame on the Exodus story to keep in mind for the Seder is that we are often prone to tell love stories again and again. And as I talk about love stories, I hope that people can think expansively about love stories and the love stories that we tell and like to tell over and over. Two people married for many years may never tire of telling the story about how they met. When it was that they knew that this was the real thing or a real thing. Um, what obstacles and first impressions maybe had to be overcome in order to land in truly deep relationship. That's one version of a love story that we might want to tell and retell year after year. A parent may never tire of thinking back to the first moment of seeing their new baby's face and all of the various details of their child's personality unfolding as they come to know more clearly the object of their love. That is another version of a love story people like to tell over and over. Two good friends might have the specific stories that they like to tell over and over again. They could finish the story for each other um, about how they came into, into deep relationship and some of the most formative moments in that. So that's what we mean by the power of this fusion between the book of Exodus and Shir Hashirim, the love story, the love poem. Um, while it definitely adds a lot of color to the Exodus story, we're not aiming for 
a kind of rose-colored rom-com kind of love story. So framing the exodus of love story isn't to say that it's all about roses and chocolate or whatever. The story of falling in love can include many rises and falls, uncertainty, fear, anxiety even, alongside curiosity and trust. It can include coming to understand each other's limits and shortcomings. It can include being disappointed by each other. It can include coming to understand our own limits and shortcomings, being disappointed with ourselves, and to have a sense of who we are and what our strengths and weaknesses are with greater clarity. This evening, we're going to focus on the prologue, the backstory. Most of this course is a love story in four scenes, looking at four pivotal moments in the Exodus story that we could point to and say, oh, that's the moment. That's the moment where this relationship cemented. And I'm really, I'm curious and wish I could be a fly on the wall in the room in all of your Chavruta learning as you um, encounter, decipher, think through, explore those four different scenes. But today we're doing the prologue, the backstory. What are the earliest origins of how this love story between God and Israel began? What set the stage for its unfolding? And again, this isn't a rose-colored narrative. What's some of the baggage, even trauma, that we as a people carried into this relationship with God before the pivotal moments of the Exodus story and the unfolding of that relationship. That's what's going to take our attention this evening. Um, there's a source sheet that is going to land in the chat, thanks to our incredibly skilled moderator, Bachi. Thank you so much for being here and making this happen and picking an awesome music list for us to listen to as folks were coming in. Um, and I invite you to, to download that and have that, um, have that with you. I'm going to screen share to work through the material this evening. And um, the way we're going to do this is I will introduce, explore um, a text and then there'll be a chance to pause. I'll take us out of screen share, see if there are questions in the chat, comments in the chat to engage with and make the learning richer. Okay, great, so here we go. Okay, how we fell in love. This, this is telling the whole story telling the whole story. We're going to start with the Mishnah that sets the scene of the Seder, um, the cups of wine, what we do for each step, a la Roman banquet, where, you know, we're so, we're so used to the meaning of the four cups of wine at the Seder and the journey of the Seder. Um, and in many ways, even before the specifics of it, um, you bring us to uh, the book of Proverbs and some passages in the Talmud that just describe how wine is meant to draw out the heart. And so even just this process of pouring multiple cups of wine um, on Seder night is about drawing out the story, um, drawing, out, drawing out the full story that sometimes stays inside. So here we go. They pour a second cup, says the Mishnah in chapter 10 of Psachim. And here the child asks their parent, and we see the first version of the four questions in the Mishnah. Pour the second cup, and here the child asks, right? It's a second cup of wine, while well, like, there's still no meal in sight. So that in and of itself maybe begs a question, why are we pouring so much wine before we actually have our full meal? But I want to go to the phrase that the Mishnah uses to, um, to describe how we tell the story we're going to tell. According to the mental readiness of the child, the parent teaches them. So there's a relational aspect 
to this story already, this love story of how we as a people and God fell in love with each other. It's being told through this relational um, encounter between the parent and the child and a responsive encounter at that. But this is the part I want to focus on. Matril bignut u mesayem bashabach. You start with disgrace and conclude with glory, glory or um, appreciation, improvement. We're, we're telling an arc of a story. It's not a flat narrative of um, God came in and everything was fine. It's a more complicated story. Vidoresh me arami oved avi ad shigmar kol kula. We're going to expound the verses that are described in the Torah as the verses we recite when we bring the first fruits, the bikurim, to the land where we we tell our whole story in only four verses. In only four verses, um, starting with arami oved avi, my father was a fugitive Aramean until completing the entire section, right? And this idea of Arami Oved Avi, um, it begs quite a lot of commentary. What exactly do those words mean? My father was a fugitive Aramean, but the point is the story doesn't start with the 10 plagues and the moment of the Exodus. It starts earlier than that. And that's our quest this evening, to look at what parts of the backstory do we need to spend some time with before we can embark on the real, um, the real meat of the story that we get in the scenes that you'll be exploring in Chavruta. Okay, and this is what I wanna look at. Again, thinking about how um, the origins of deep relationship often can bring to the surface some of the more difficult parts of our past, of our personalities, right? We bring all of that with us when we're ready to embark in relationship. So we're gonna look at this phrase. What does it mean? Matril bignut, you start with disgrace. What is the disgrace, asks the Talmud. What kind of disgrace are we talking about? What, what messy, ugly stuff? has to rise to the surface before we can embark on this beautiful telling of redemption and relationship with God. So there's two answers. Rav said, you have to start with, from the beginning, our ancestors were idol worshipers. From the beginning, our ancestors were idol worshipers. And we do have this in our Haggadah. And he is in a debate with Shmuel. Shmuel said, Avadim Hayinu, we were slaves. So two different versions of the disgrace. One, I would call a disgrace of our own deeds or behaviors. We were of Devodazara. We were idol worshipers. Those were our own roots. Thinking back to Avram and where he began. He was an idol worshiper. His ancestors, his parents were idol worshipers. Right? That's that's the beginning of our story, knowing that we ourselves have done things that we are ashamed of. Disgrace of our own deeds, that that's in our roots, in our past. And the other option is we were slaves. That is more of a disgrace of our position, mistreatment that was done towards us. That is another kind of disgrace. Now, this is maybe a little bit darker and heavy than you were hoping for for a course that's about a love story and how we fall in love in God, with, but that's actually exactly the point. If we're going to tell this story and we're going to tell this story authentically and honestly, it's going to start with that stuff that we would maybe rather was always hidden beneath the, um, that was always hidden beneath the surface. Okay. Um, now we have both of these in our actual, in the actual Haggadah. We have both Rav and Shmuel, um, the disgrace of deed and the disgrace of our own dignity. 
Um, and we're going to explore each of those in somewhat midrashic ways this evening. Um, what exactly are these messy origins that have to emerge on Seder night? Okay, I'm seeing that the the glad that we have a very animated chat around um, disgrace, and I, I'll spend a little bit of time on one piece that's surfacing here. Um, why is it a disgrace to have been slaves? Why is it a disgrace to have been slaves? And yeah, I I think it may be. Um, it's sort of hard and certainly sad or tragic to wrap our heads around this. But the way that the Gemara seems to be approaching this is there are sort of two different things, two very different things that could lead to a sense of wanting to hide a certain part of our history. There's the disgrace of things that we did, disgrace of our own shameful behavior. And separate from that, there's a disgrace that we might think of as totally beyond our control, a disgrace of being victims to somebody else's power and mistreatment and oppression, not because we did anything wrong, but because it was an unfortunate, um, it was an unfortunate position to occupy that we, we wish we had never had that experience. But I, I think part of the pointer is these are two parts of our past that we maybe wish would have never happened. Okay, so as we go on, the idea is we actually have to tell these darker parts of the story in order to be ready to embark on this journey of falling in love with none other than the divine. Okay, on this next page, you can feel free to look at this on your own. We have that full passage of the verses that we recite at the Seder and expound at the Seder. Um, and as somebody was mentioning in the chat, my father was a fugitive Aramean, often refers to, um, to Yaakov, who had to, to, had to wander to Lavan's house. Much more on that. You can expound the story in your own Seder in just a little less than a month. Okay, so here we're going to embark on the, the part of, of the story that's not in the Haggadah, but I want to say I think helps us understand the Haggadah better. And this is first tracing our messy origins, the messy origins of this love story. We're gonna go back to Avram and the disgrace of deed. Um, I think often the idea of our ancestors were idol worshipers is something that we don't necessarily feel particularly attached to. We don't feel the residue of idol worship in any classical sense of how idol worship is generally understood, people bowing down to some physical um, physical object in some sense that there's some other gods who have power in the world. We maybe don't feel that connected to that, although certainly many, many people see remnants of that kind of idol worship in all sorts of ways in our contemporary world and moment. But I wanna, I wanna look at certain parts of the story of Avram and Sarah and how there is disgrace of deed, disgrace of our own behaviors that are part of that story that need to be named before we are ready to embark on the rest of the journey of the Exodus and this journey of falling in love with God. Okay, so we're gonna look more at Avram and see some parts of the story that actually we might be able to relate to a little bit more and, and own as some of our own genut disgrace that needs to be surfaced rather than submerged. Okay, so we have this story of, of God first talking to Avram in Parshat, Lech Lecha, go forth, Lech Lecha, from your native land, from your father's house to the land that I will show you. This is the first moment of God speaking to Avram, and there is a beautiful promise, I will make you a great nation, I will bless you, I will make your name great, you shall be a blessing and all of that, okay? All of the, the blessing that happens here. And I would say it's important to understand that the Midrash reads this scene not in um, what in later medieval times turns into a sort of rationalist telling of how Abraham um, discovered God through his intellect and philosophical musings, 
but actually a much more um, kind of emotional, you might even say somewhat erotic love story. This is God falling in love with Avram. So we have in Breshid Rabbah, God said to Avraham, go, lech lecha. The Midrash here reads that verse of God first speaking to Abraham, le- reads that in the light of a verse from Psalms. The verse from Psalms is, listen, daughter, see and incline your ear, forget your nation and your father's house. And the continuation of that passage that I brought for you here is, and let the king be aroused by your beauty, since he is your God or your master, bow to him. Okay, so this is our first scene of God meeting Abraham, embarking on relationship with Abraham. And we see that the rabbis view that as God essentially seeing Abraham's beauty, right? Telling Abraham to leave his his past um, behind, to leave that, that house he grew up in and essentially um, marry God, so to speak, right? Embark on this relationship of, of um, some kind of love and even sensuality with God. That is our story here. There is a promise that's born of a moment of love. And um, this promise, right? You're going to be a great nation, right? We'll have lots of children. You'll have lots of children. There'll be a blessing. It's all going to be so beautiful, right? That's the initial scene here of Lech Lecha and of Avram's relationship with God. Um, so I, I hope you, you sense from this Midrash a way that we can read that moment, um, not just as the beginnings of religious faith, but the beginning of, of a deep relationship and a promise born of that, a promise born of that love. But that promise doesn't really last long or go smoothly. Okay, so this is what we mean by this is going to be a roller coaster of a journey of falling in love. And the first aspect of what's messy about this relationship of God and Abraham falling in love is um, right, we know that the way the story goes, that promise of you'll be a great nation, it doesn't happen immediately. There's famine and there's 10 whole years of infertility where there's no child and certainly no great, great nation unfolding. Um, so the, the part here to focus on is um, there's this beautiful moment of love, a promise, and then it goes, it goes wrong. It's disappointing. It doesn't happen according to plan in the way that Avram might have expected. And we're going to turn to the first piece of that and unpacking Ginut, right, the disgrace of this messy beginning of this relationship with God in terms of disgrace of our own behavior and responding to it. Okay. So to go back to Rav, right, Rav says Ginut, that disgrace that we have to mention on the night of the Seder, that's the disgrace of being idol worshipers. It's the disgrace of our own misdeeds. It's the disgrace of our own misdeeds. That's what has to surface on the night of the Seder, um, on the night of recounting this love story. And that's what we're going to look at right now. So when there are 10 years where nothing is going according to plan for Avram and Sarai, and there's famine, and there's no children, um, we see in Genesis that Sarai, Avram's wife, since she had borne no children, she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. And so I said to Avram, look, God has kept me from bearing children. Consort with my maid. Perhaps I shall have a son through her. So this is Sarai trying to have a child, giving her servant to Avram, Hagar. Avram listens. So Sarai, Avram's wife, took her maid, Hagar, the Egyptian. After Avram had dwelt in the land of Canaan for 10 years and gave her to her husband, Avram, as a concubine, though really in the Hebrew, it says Li'isha as a wife. 
Okay. Um, Avram then conceives a child with Hagar. She conceives when she saw that her mistress, Sarai, was lowered in her esteem. We don't know exactly how that manifested, if she mocked Sarai, if she just didn't want to serve her, but she is no longer treating Sarai with the same kind of respect that she had in the past. And Sarai said to Avram, the wrong done me is your fault, right? I gave you Hagar, but she sees that she's pregnant and now I'm lowered in her esteem. Right? Let God judge the situation. And Avram says to Sarai, your maid is in your hands. Deal with her as you think right. And Sarai treated her harshly and she ran away from her. Vate'aneha Sarai. Vatifrach mi paneha. Vate'aneha Sarai is really the word that we want to focus on here. Sarai treated her harshly. Now this is kind of a, a messy love story within the love story of God and and Avram, we have this messy kind of triangle. It's not exactly a classic love triangle. They're not exactly arguing over who's in love with whom. Um, but there is the messiness of this intimate relationship as, as Sarai is trying to figure out how to have a child. And there's quite a lot of complexity of emotion. Um, Sarai seems to be maybe mistreated to some extent by Hagar, who stops honoring her fully. But Sarai then mistreats her. We have an active verb around that. She treated her harshly. She afflicted her. Okay. Now I'm going to look at two comments on this and then I'll, I'll pause for questions, comments. Um, this moment we, I think, know is, is maybe sad and difficult and tragic as we're reading for, through Genesis, but it's actually formative. It's formative for understanding the Exodus story. We cannot tell the Exodus story without going back to this moment. And what I wanna to present to you this evening is that this is a moment of disgrace. This is a moment of disgrace of our own deeds um, that we have to tell before we can try to embark on some kind of journey of being in deep relationship with God and God taking us out from Egypt of slaves. We have to tell this part of the story. And here's why. Um, Nachmanides, the medieval commentary on this part of Genesis, points out that Sarai, when she's initially, when she's initially um, inviting Hagar into this relationship to try to bear a child with Avram, she was she was very well intentioned. It says the verse mentions that Sarah, the wife of Avraham gave Hagar as a wife for Avraham to hint that Sarai did not give up on her marriage to Avraham, nor distance herself from him. She was his wife and he her husband, but she wanted Hagar to be his wife as well. That is why it says as a wife, that she not be a concubine. It doesn't use the word pilegesh, concubine, but actually a wife properly married to him. So it seems like Sarai wanted to actually kind of uplift Hagar into a position of being Avram's full wife. But then when Hagar um, lowers her esteem of Sarai, we see that Sarai reacted in a way that Ramban thinks was not appropriate. Then Sarai treated her harshly and she ran away from her. That's our quote from the verse. This is what Nachmanides says about that. Our foremother sinned in this mistreatment. Chata'a imenu, the inoi hazeh. This was not her finest moment. Um, as did Avraham by letting her do this. They're both guilty of this mistreatment. And God heard her mistreatment. This should sound familiar in terms of resonance with some of the Exodus story. God heard her mistreatment and gave her a son who would then go on to mistreat the descendants of Avram and Sarai in all manner of afflictions. 
right? And this word inoi is a key word in the Exodus story. So here we have, what are the messy origins of the Exodus story? We have Sarai afflicting Hagar, the Egyptian. That's considered a sin here in Nachmanides telling, even if she was provoked, it's considered a sin. And that is what leads to the affliction of their descendants in Egypt. Okay, we'll look at one more, one more passage here of a similar quality, and, and then I'll turn to your questions and comments. Um, Radak, right, a little bit later, a medieval commentator. Sarai treated her harshly, he says, she was excessive and made her do back-breaking labor. Avda ba befarach, right, that should also look similar from the Exodus story. Made her do back-breaking labor. She maybe have beat her, cursed her, and Hagar couldn't bear it and ran away. Sarai did not act appropriately or piously in this situation. A person shouldn't do all that is in their power to those under them. That he sees as the main message of this story. Right? She had the power and Avram said, well, you can do whatever you want. She's your servant, you can do whatever you want. She shouldn't have acted this way. She went too far with the power that she had over Hagar. Um, and so God listens to her suffering, offers her a blessing. And what we learn from this is, oops, sorry. Roller coaster of screen share. He says at the end, this story is written in the Torah for a person to derive good qualities from it and stay away from bad qualities, meaning this is actually an anti-exemplary story. It's a story of a foremother where we are supposed to learn what not to do. Okay, so that's what I want to raise here as um, maybe a bit more of a resonant version of mitchila of de avodazara avotino right our our ancestors in our roots we have um we have actually been doers of behavior that was not that is not behavior we we should be proud of um it's our our role, acknowledging some role that we might have in, um, in oppression. Okay, I'm gonna stop the screen share here for a minute or two, whoops, there we go. And see if there are questions, comments on this part of the backstory to the Exodus story. Um, let's see, Rebecca, I saw that you raised your hand. I'm happy for you to ask or question or make a comment here. Rebecca Gare. It was accidental, sorry. Oh, okay. Well, it's nice to hear your voice for a second anyway. Great. Um, yes, Melly. Hi, thanks. Um, Fantastic evening, really great new insights for me. Um, what, I, what I find myself wondering about here is about the historical context of the time. I think it's, it's one of the, the, the risks is to look at that behavior, <clears throat> excuse me, that behavior from 2021. And I think, I think it's a real challenge. I mean, I say this with compassion. I have a hard time with this too, to see it in, well, what was the norm at the time? So that's what I wonder about. Thanks. Mm -hmm. The norm of the time in terms of the treatment of Hagar or the norm yeah. of the time in yeah. terms of I mean, idolatry? The, the, the offering a concubine in order to have a child, the treatment of them, the whole, that whole relationship dynamic. Um, they were of different cultures. Um, yeah, okay. Go, yeah, so. thank you. So, yeah, thank you. In some ways, what I find most interesting about Nachmanides' comment is that Nachmanides makes sure to say from the beginning that actually Sarai Sarah was, um, was trying to set up a situation 
where she and Sarah would, would be in somewhat equal relationship with Avram, right? She wanted to give Hagar as a full wife, not as someone of lower status, not actually just entirely someone to like be used as a surrogate, right? She wants to give her as a wife. It's really interesting that piece of his comment. It seems like she was actually totally ready to, um, to create um, this sort of dignified position for Hagar. And then she gets provoked when, when Hagar gets pregnant. And we don't really know what Hagar was doing, but, but somehow it wasn't treating her with the same kind of respect. And then it seems like that puts her over the edge and, and she overreacts. So I, I think, you know, I'm, I don't know everything about the context there. The, the way that Nachmanides frames that, um, giving the, the servant as a full wife, it seems to me like that wouldn't necessarily be particularly common. It seems like it would be more common to have the slave act as a surrogate. Um, but what I think is interesting there is that he's saying just on a local level, the intention that she had wasn't borne out by her actions, right? Because she then ends up mistreating her. Um, okay. Yeah, I think that this is the first example that we have in the Torah of, of mistreatment of, of a ger, right? Of the, of the stranger who is with you, of Hagar is, right? The name is Ha-ger in many ways, and we'll come back to that um, in a minute. Okay, yes, Rhoda? Yeah, I was, I was wondering, is, is there an implication that there's a connection between the Egyptians and Ishmael? Um, right, so it's not explicit there in that comment, right, Ishmael, we think of as, as being in, in the desert more, but I think it's more, um, right, and, and he's going to be wild and he's going to do, he's going to do bad things, but I think it's, it's the, the Hagar as the Egyptian and that language of Enoi, just that verb, that's the same verb that's used to describe the Israelites in Egypt. I think that's what gets you there. Just as an aside, methodologically, Nachmanides often talks about how ma'aseh avot siman lebanim, what the ancestors did in those stories in Genesis sort of lays the, the groundwork or foreshadow or structure for what will happen to the Israelites um, later on in the book of Exodus. So even if, even if it doesn't work like 100% exactly that like Ishmael isn't the one who's afflicting them, but like Ishmael isn't Pharaoh, um, but I, I think the, the literary connection is, is there. Um, okay, I think it's, it's heavy and obviously there's so much, if we're just trying to understand Sarah personally, right? There's so much emotion that can be part of wanting to have a child and not being able to. Um, and so from a psychological perspective, I think it's a little bit harsh to jump to a, a full kind of judgment or rebuke of Sarah. Um, I don't know that that's totally fair. And again, that's the complexity of you want to tell the love story, you want to tell the whole story, you want to tell the messy origins, then we're going to have to get into some of this complex baggage that we carry, where it's not actually so easy to like assign, you know, full responsibility or blame. And yet it's possible to point to genut, to, to, to point to some aspects of disgrace, right? Some things that we are not the most proud of in our own behavior um, and how we have kind of handled the experiences we've been thrown even if that's not a totally black and white picture. It's not a binary, you know, we were 100% wrong in a situation. It's still um, being able to surface some of the, some of the disgrace and things we're less proud of. Um, okay, great. Yeah, we're seeing a comment here about the importance of thinking about love in, in a context, in a much greater context. Um, Right, in a context of all sorts of relationships and histories of power. Thank you. Um, okay. 
I, I'm going to move us along in some of these sources, but if you still have a comment, hang on to it and we'll have more chance for discussion. Um, okay, but that's our first kind of associative journey into Matriline Bignut. And I will say that then, what does the story become? I just have to put this here because it's so, it's so central that people already pointed to it a little bit. What does the story become? If there's supposed to be an arc, Matriline Bignut, if we're, if we're leading towards something that is a little bit more glorious, something we're more proud of, um, what is the narrative of this arc, right? There's the story of identifying our roots that included disgraceful deeds of oppressing um, oppressing the Egyptian, right? Oppressing the, the Egyptian who was, who was the stranger and was the servant. Um, the Exodus story then might culminate in this line in Devarim, though we also have this in the in the set of laws in the Covenant Code in, in Mishpatim, um, right? That what we're coming to through our love story with God, through falling in love with God, we are trying to come into a more expansive possibility of love that that can spread outward. Okay, so. Right, we have that that you know one of the um, one of the qualities of God is that God is ohev ger, befriends the stranger, right, providing with food and clothing. You too must befriend the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. That might, in many ways, be the quintessential lesson that we are supposed to be learning from this whole story of. Of the Exodus, and I just want to—I just want to tell this in the most kind of distilled um, two possibilities that are represented here. Right? We have this story that I'm painting here of God falls in love with Avram, maybe Avram and, and Sarah. Um, there's a promise of being this special people that brings blessing into the world. In the immediate aftermath of that when Sarai isn't able to have her own child, right? That love that was supposed to be a, a divine, right? A divine love story that brought blessing to the world instead brings mistreatment into the world, right? It brings oppression as Sarai becomes jealous and feels, um, and feels mistreated, right? And, and for her not being the one who's carrying the pregnancy, and that's supposed to be the pregnancy that will bring about this special, uh, this special nation that has this mission that's about this whole relationship with God. And um, that sense of being in special relationship with God leads to oppression in the story of Hagar. And the arc that we're describing is totally different that by virtue of um, being in this deep relationship with God that the story of Exodus cements, we would come out on the other end with a mentality of the ahavta metager, that we have this um, love with God that generates love for others um, as a sort of tikkun, right? Some kind of arc of, of repair for what happened before. Um, okay. Just checking up on the chat here a bit now. Yeah, and I'm seeing, it's interesting that I'm focusing on this story when it's not in the Haggadah. No, it's not in the Haggadah, that is true. And what I, what I hope this class will give you, not everything that we're doing is gonna be in the Haggadah in any way, um, but what I'm hoping this class will give you is a chance to develop some of the themes of the Seder and kind of run with them expound them, just like we're supposed to be expounding these verses um, that, the, that the Mishnah talks about, um, those core verses in the book of Deuteronomy that are really at the core of the Magid section of the Seder, we're supposed to expound them. I'm suggesting that this is expounding this idea of we start with Ginut, we start with the disgrace and specifically that disgrace of our, of our early ancestors 
um, their roots in idol worship, according to the Talmud and according to the Haggadah. Um, but I think if we really embrace that, what, it, what, what are the disgrace in deed moments that we have to name um, and that we grow out of, right? That we grow from this story of Sarah is, is an example of a disgrace indeed that we that we move through in the Seder and in the Exodus. Okay. Um, I'm gonna move to the second part of Matrilin Bignut. We begin with disgrace. Okay, so this is, again, thinking about the origins of love as messy origins. Avadim hayinu, we were slaves. The disgrace of our own trauma, coming, moving from the disgrace of our own trauma as slaves to, um, to a place of love and connection. So if the, the previous arc was the disgrace of our deeds and taking responsibility for our role in oppression, Right, moving through that to Vahavdam at Hagar, being able to fully love the stranger. And this is what if what if we tell a story that starts with the disgrace of our of our trauma, of our mistreatment of being victims of oppression, um, and being able to move from that through this story of the Exodus and falling in love with God, right? How can that move us out of our of our own trauma? Okay. So for this, I want to bring a midrash that really focuses on a different kind of love, um, not the more intimate love between two partners um, in romantic relationship. Oh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? No. You lost me? Yes. I can hear you. Yes, you can hear me now? can hear you. Okay, great. Amazing. I think the headset did something weird for a second. Um, I want to look at this midrash that is more about the love between parent and child. And, and I wanted to bring these two examples because as you're doing this course, um, yes, you're going to be rooted in the love story of Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs. That's very much about sort of romantic intimacy of, of two partners. Um, but I hope that you'll you'll take that into all sorts of other relationships of love as well. Okay, so we're gonna look at this Midrash that has a number of different forms, but we're looking at one that's in the collection, Otsar HaMidrashim. Um, so we'll look, at, we'll look at a version of the ending that comes from a different version of the story. Okay, so here we go. How do we know that the sons thrown into the Nile River went up with their fathers out of Egypt? That's the question of this Midrash. Now, this is a question where the Midrash assumes the answer is yes. Of course, they also went out of Egypt. Um, I don't know that that would have been our assumption reading the story as it is in the Exodus. It seems like there was a whole lot of loss. There was a whole lot of loss in the experience of being slaves, including the many babies who died um, in the Nile River. And that's just part of this story of embarking on this relationship with God and spending time in Egypt and being slaves is that there's a lot of loss. This Midrash is not willing to accept that loss. It must be that those sons thrown into the Nile River went up with their fathers out of Egypt. And what I, what I wanna say here is, right, the trauma would just be too great um, right, this Midrash can't fully accept the trauma and loss of all of those, all of those babies just dying and being lost. Um, okay, so here's how we know. We get this beautiful, beautiful story. The Holy Blessed One signaled to the angel appointed over the water, Malach Hamimunel Amayim, and it spit them out into the wilderness, right, the water the river, spit out those babies who were cast into the river into the wilderness, into the Midbar. 
And there in the wilderness, they ate and drank and flourished there. Okay, so all these babies their parents thought were dead were actually living in the wilderness. Okay, the Midrash sort of follows through on all the details here. From where did they have food? Well, we know they have food because God could give them food. Know that the Holy Blessed One appointed for them two rocks, one of oil and one of honey. Shnei Selaim. As it says, we have a verse from Deuteronomy from Parshat Ha'azinu, the poem in, um, towards the end of Deuteronomy. Um, he nursed him with honey from the crag and oil from the flinty rock. So this in the poem is talking about God treating Israel, but the Midrash is reading this in a much more specific way as God actually like nursing babies, um, small infants who had been thrown into the river, right? Nursing them through rocks that are obviously in the desert. That's where you would find rocks. Okay, so this is um, this is a sort of beautiful story, certainly one of the stories where God takes on more maternal features. Um, but that's that's that story. Now here's what I wanna here's what I wanna look at is the two different endings of this very sweet story. And again, this is sort of imagining the the love story between God and Israel where nobody's nobody's left out. Nobody's Nobody was just lost by having to be thrown in the river. Here's ending one. When the people of Israel were on the banks of the Reed Sea, um, their children came in front of them and opened their mouths and said, these are our fathers, Elu Avotenu. Okay, you have to kind of fill in some of the gaps here, right? The idea is you have a parent who had a baby boy, had to throw that baby boy in the Nile, right? That baby they thought drowned in the Nile. Um, instead, the Nile spits them out and they get raised by God in the desert. But now when the Israelites leave Egypt and they come to the banks of the sea, their children greet them. Their children who are desert children raised by God, greet them and these children say, oh my gosh, these are our fathers who we've been estranged from for all these years. And their fathers open their mouths, right? Their fathers who are now seeing their children for the first time, thinking that their children had, were dead, had drowned. The fathers see their children and say, this is my God and I will glorify him. And um, that's a quote from the Song of the Sea, sorry, I didn't put in that reference from chapter 15 in Exodus. This is my God and I will glorify him. And then their sons say, God of my father and I will exalt him. Elohei aviva ramamenhu, that's just the continuation of that verse in chapter 15, the Song of the Sea. Okay, this is a very sweet story, but this is theologically really fascinating as a story because what's happening here the first moment that the Israelites recognize God, right? This verse, Ze Eliva and Vehu, this is my God and I will glorify him. The Midrash in other places says this explicitly, right? Imagines that this is a moment where the Israelites are pointing. Ze always indicates pointing for the Midrash. They're pointing to God. They have a clarity of vision around seeing God. And in this Midrash, that is coincide. That's coincidental with being reunited with their children. The moment of um, recovering from the trauma of having had to throw their children into the Nile is exactly the same moment of um, seeing God in their lives, right? being able to identify God. Um, okay. So, right, what, <laughs> excuse me, what, what is the, the point of this here, right? This love story between Israel and God is actually totally wrapped up with a love story between parent and child in this Midrash. And I would say that this is actually in some ways the opposite of the love story, the divine love story of, of Abraham, where Abraham had to leave his father's house, right? That's what God says. God says, leave your father's house, come be in relationship with me. And that's actually going to be instead of 
the familial relationship that you have, right? There's a dislocation there and in some ways disorienting nature to that divine love story. In this moment of a divine love story, um, falling in love with God, seeing God clearly in our lives is the same as falling in love more deeply with people in our own in our own families, right? That's all happening at once. And their sons say, um, Elohei Aviva Romamen, who write the, the children now, even though the children were like raised by God, they were nursed by God, you'd think like they know God pretty well on their own terms. They now get to see their their parents um, come to know God as God who is right stepping in and um, and resolving trauma that they had experienced right so they get to know this God through their through witnessing their parents new relationship to God as well okay I'm gonna um, pause here well you know what maybe we'll look at ending two and then I'll pause the the second ending of this story is similar but a little bit different um here again we have the Israelites in Egypt parents who had to throw their children into the sea think their kids have drowned we have the river spit them out and they're actually flourishing in deserts being raised by God now you have when they grew up, when the children grew up, they would come to their homes in flocks. These flocks of babies would come home. Okay, so they have their reunification moment happens while their parents are still in Egypt as slaves. Um, and now when the Holy Blessed One was revealed at the sea, right after they crossed the sea, they, these children who were raised by God, recognized God first. As it says, this is my God and I will glorify him. Right? Being able to point to, to God and say, oh, that's God, implies that you already knew God. If you can point to something and say, I know what that is. I know what that is. I know what that's called. I know what that is because I have some sort of prior relationship with it. The only ones who had prior relationship with God are these babies who had been raised by God. So here the children are actually the, the kind of vehicle for identifying who God is in this moment of revelation and crossing the sea. And they presumably then bring their parents also into relationship with God. So again, a version of the story where the trauma of being, of being slaves in Egypt and having to, um, and having to do the, the absolutely horrifying thing that was decreed upon B'nai Israel, upon the Israelites then of, of having to, um, to give up their, their infants and throw them into the Nile. And the trauma of that is, um, is resolved by God, right? God steps in to respond to that trauma and letting go of that trauma and coming into deep relationship with God are um, are kind of one and the same in leading to a sense of wholeness and and unification within the depths of the interpersonal familial relationship. Okay, I'm gonna stop my share here and pause for for comments on this version of Matrilin Bignut. We start with the disgrace of trauma, right? That trauma of being slaves, of having no control over something as basic as being able to have a child, raise that child. Um, and, and how there's this reunification that happens with God, where falling in love with God also means the family pieces, the family units being in deep relationship with each other. Um, okay, any questions, comments on that? Let's see if I can take in what's been coming through in the chat as well. There are a lot of different versions of this Midrash Masachet Sota in the Talmud also has a very long version of it. Um,
Yeah. Okay. And we're hearing some interesting, interesting things about this. God here feels like a very maternal, maternal God nursing these babies in the desert. Um, and then leading to right reunification. And yes, that is actually the source of sweet honey in the rock, that, that verse, that biblical verse. At least that's one source for that idea. Um, okay. There's so many beautiful things here in the chat. I'm trying to take it in. Yeah, okay, and I think to, to pick up on David's comment here in the chat, right, these two, these two um, motifs that I brought you of, of deep relationship of love, um, the one being more about intimate lovers, the other being about parent and child. I hope what we've seen here are the ways in which, you know, there's, there's, so, there's so many ways to tell a love story and so many, so many possibilities of what it could be to, to trace a journey of um, something like falling in love with God. Um, and I hope that these two stories at least point us to how Matriline Bignut, you have to tell the whole story, right? That means actually surfacing all of the parts of ourselves and our past and our communities, right? Bringing all of that into this religious journey, um, whatever it means to try to be in this journey and quest of um, some kind of relationship of, of love with the divine. I hope what we see here are ways in which Right, that could be a kind of dangerous thing. A relationship of love could lead to jealousy and strife. Um, but what we want to do in this story of, of the Exodus and how we tell it each year, and it's important how we tell these formative stories each year, is reach for a story that can really um, integrate, but also bring us through and bring us to the possibility of growth through um, those parts of our histories that we are less that we are less proud of and maybe wish we could let go of whether that has to do with our own responsibility and action or whether that has to do with circumstance that we've been put into right so to name that to articulate that to bring that into this relationship with god that um that hopefully then results in a much more expansive um picture of of drawing connection I'm gonna um, I'm gonna catapult you into the the image that's gonna guide you for the rest of your learning. But first, I'll hear from Nahama. I was actually gonna say that I think that the jealousy is very central here um, because it seems like a lot of the different stories that we're talking about, um, Avram and Sarai are denied a child. It seems that God is very jealous of the relationship that has developed with Yitzchak. And perhaps that that is the um, impetus behind Akedah is for him to prove his devotion to God over Yitzchak. And similarly, these in this midrash we learned these children are separated from their parents, and it seems like God is very jealous of the relationship of parents with children. And you know, Moshe completely becomes an absentee father once he um, starts starts working for God. So it just seems like there's a lot of separation between parents and their children, um, that is part of the relationship of develop that develops with God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that is, that is there, that is certainly there in some of the sources and you're pointing to some of them. Um, and I think that this, I think that this last Midrash that we spent some time with has a, a little bit more of a reparative response to that. Right where there is this more um, holistic and coincidental right, intertwining of the parents and their sense of connection to their children and their sense of connection to God. But yeah, I think there are many stories that point in different direction. I am. Um, I will say, in terms of what what has influenced me in this reading, I'll say one thing about that um, that came up as a question in the chat as well. 
I, I have textual and I'm sure also personal reasons to be invested in um, in telling the story of the Exodus this way. Textually, I actually think the earliest of sages, right, the same sages who brought us the Mishnah, the earliest of sages who, who um, embarked on the project of Midrash, just that fact of juxtaposition of seeing the Song of Songs as a key to unlock the Exodus and seeing the Exodus as a key to unlock the Song of Songs. Daniel Bayarin talks about this, the scholar, the Talmud scholar, Daniel Bayarin talks about this in his book, Intertextuality and the Reading of Midrash. And um, that's huge and formative and it didn't have to be like that, right? You didn't have to bring the Song of Songs and the intimacy and depth of that um, to the Exodus story. It would have been a great story even without that frame. And so I think there's a little bit of a challenge there that the rabbis want to bring us to, which is bringing all of the intensity and complexity of intimate intimacy and map that on to how we tell our story of what it means to be in relationship with God and be the Jewish people. Um, and that's, I, I actually think is the challenge of, of the Seder each year and each night um, is telling that story like it's a really formative story that means a lot to us and has the ups and downs. And the Song of Songs is all about searching for God and not or searching for the lover, not finding the lover. There's a lot of absence and presence. Um, so I, I, I sort of want to highlight the way that I think the rabbis want us to understand the Exodus through this lens and, and hopefully the the class and um, Chavruta you'll embark on will, will help you get there in so many in so many ways. I will say you'll you'll be introduced to one verse from the Song of Songs in your first session in Chavruta. It's going to talk about two flowers in that poetic verse, and that is going to be um, the catalyst for understanding the Exodus as as a story of growth a story of coming from a sense of, of sheltering, but fear and hiding to a story of song and expression. So kind of coming into our own as full beings through developing this relationship with God. I really hope you enjoy your learning. Um, you'll get everything you need in your email for your first session if you haven't already. And I'm gonna hand it over briefly to Ali for one final word. So, so great to learn with all of you. Thanks for your engaged comments and questions in the chat and live. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Rafa Ziva. That was so beautiful um, and such a wonderful way to start our learning. So thank you. Um, I just wanna um, share a quick brief announcement, which is that Hadar has a Pesach reader um, which we will send to you, to your door, hard copy, free of charge. Um, but the deadline to sign up to receive that is this Friday. So I am putting, I'm going to put in the chat a few times because I know there's a lot going on in the chat right now. Um, the sign up, if you are interested in receiving the reader, um, we will send it to you, to your door. And it will be a real printed copy, not on a screen like everything else these days. Um, so that will arrive if you sign up by Friday. Um, and I also just wanted to let you know that we have all kinds of other pre pesach learning opportunities um, available coming up in the coming weeks. So if you are interested in joining us for other learning beyond your Project Zoo learning, we would love to have you. Um, and you can also access everything through the site that I just put into the chat and I will keep putting them in as the chat recycles. So thank you so much. Enjoy your learning as you start and meet your Chavrutas this week. And that's all. Thanks for joining us.